resume recording. Okay. Great. Okay, so my research really started about 20 years ago um, in my late teens when I was struggling to just live life, to get up and go to work and have energy at work, um, to be in a relationship, to be social. Um, I had chronic constipation and a lot of history of trauma and pain with no answers and no support. So um, I joined, I started working with a homeopath and he started to teach me about the nervous system and what happens when we're in chronic fight or flight. And that's where I realized I just knew I had to get into this industry in this field. The passion I felt for understanding my body and my symptoms was innate. It wasn't anything I had to force. I just have had this like hunger for understanding human pain and the anatomy and physiology behind it. Um, so as an attempt to fix my body and, you know, as many tr complex trauma victims do, became really obsessed with my body. And I started fitness com competitions in 2006 and I went pro. I had a mildly successful uh, career as a fitness model and it really just fueled my perfectionism and body dysmorphia, anxiety, gut health issues, et cetera. So I've really been through the process of, you know, putting my body through the ringer after intense stress and childhood trauma, um, which really gives me something to look back on and, you know, a point of reference when I'm, when I'm stressed and I might notice things are slipping and be I'm becoming hypervigilant of my body or my food, which really doesn't happen much anymore. But I remember and I remind myself that those are old patterns you know, and I have new strategies to work with those triggers. Um, I then started working on, for those of you in the States, you probably won't know this, um, this uh, platform, but CTV, I was on the Marilyn Dennis show for years as a health expert. And um, is there someone trying to get in? There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I just started doing TV and found my voice and started getting, you know, building my strength as an expert and, you know, presentations. Around that time, I opened up um, a fitness facility in Leslieville in Ontario, in Toronto. And I just started to really get interested in like functional nutrition, um, how diets can, different ways of eating can help to manipulate different symptoms. And that inspired me to go to school to become uh, a registered holistic nutritionist. So um, that was a program where I learned, you know, all about nutrition and the anatomy and physiology, disease presentation, um, liver health, all of those things. And as I started taking clients, I realized that I really needed some coaching um, education so that I could support people through the roadblocks and through their triggers and their mindset roadblocks and their past trauma and pain. So I became a neurolinguistic programming uh, practitioner. And in that training, I learned all about the brain and all about how it functions when, especially when we're under stress and when there's been a history of intense stress. Um, so I got certified as a timeline therapist and a hypnotherapist, which I didn't really connect with. They didn't resonate with me um, as coaching styles, but they are in my, my toolkit. Um, really just because I didn't want to skip people through their pain. I didn't want to like erase it for them. I wanted to help them move through it and understand it and all of the variations of how it showed up and how to manipulate things um, from a mindset point of view going forward when, you know, people are triggered. Um, so that feels much more authentic to me. It's like a cognitive behavioral therapy type of approach. 
Um, and then shortly after, I opened up the IBS Academy uh, with a naturopathic doctor, and I specialized in treating SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. In that time, I noticed, you know, a lot of the forums and some of my clients' feedback would be people relapse. It was common. It still is really common. And I wanted to know why are people relapsing? Like, what is the root cause? If the infection isn't the root cause, then what is? And that's what led me into um, researching autonomic nervous system dysregulation. And that's going to make more sense by the end of the lecture, if it doesn't already. Um, so that's where I started to really understand and learn and look into the nervous system and how it responds to trauma and stress and how that makes people vulnerable to gut infections, autoimmune disease, chronic inflammation, um, inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera. And the power that regulating the nervous system had in making our bodies okay because I didn't want to just keep throwing supplements at people. Um, I didn't want to give them the idea that, hey, if you do this eight week program, you're going to be fine after. It's like, no, let me, let me teach you how to do this for yourself ongoing so you're not relying on special diets and supplements to get your body feeling good again. Um, and then I, as I mentioned at the beginning of our call, I founded the Stigma Effect in 2020, which is a fundraiser for mental health, um, all about interviewing different doctors, leading uh, functional doctors in the world of gut infections and brain health. And it's all geared toward helping people to break the stigmas around mental health um, presentations or mental illness presentations, because it's a pathology, just like a broken knee, just like you know, anything that cancer, anything that might come up in the body that, that presents as disease, it, in my eyes, it deserves the same amount of integrity and respect and care as any other type of illness. So um, those practitioners, they, what they do is just educate us on the root causes of um, anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, um, everything related with brain inflammation and toxicity and teaching my viewers, my community, how to actually get to the root of chronic mental illness presentations without um, relying long-term on medication, if that's something that is their goal. I'm definitely not against medication, I'm on medication, but um, just really passionate in helping people understand that this is more to do with toxicity, infections, and inflammation than it does with a person, like it has nothing to do with a personality trait or, or personality issue. Um, these diagnoses can and are reversed, um, can be and are reversed. And then I launched my control alt delete program, my signature brain retraining program um, in 2020 as well. So my, not to get too into it, but I, uh, from as far back as I can remember, um, grew up in a home with mentally ill, um, addicted parents. And that is where I started developing chronic constipation and food intolerances, um, mood dysregulation, depression from a very young age, apathy. Um, I started using drugs and alcohol at a really young age to self-medicate. And I struggled with addiction for a couple of decades. Um, and I've gone through the programs, you know, I've gone through outpatient treatment programs at different hospitals and there's no shame in that. They gave me the strength and the strategies and the knowledge to self-regulate as I moved through different, you know, symptoms of depression, et cetera, um, and addiction. And here I am now teaching others how to do it. And I couldn't be happier. This is exactly what I want to be doing in life. And I'm just really, really happy that you guys are here. Um, so the practices that we'll be covering in this three-day workshop are the exact techniques and principles that I've used to heal my own body from autonomic nervous system dysregulation. Um, they're physiotherapy type uh, tangible practices that you can use to heal your nervous system. Okay. And it's more of a comprehensive approach where I'm talking about other factors that are contributing to dysregulation where it's not just the nervous system like there's other factors so we're going to get into that as well danica welcome welcome sorry to keep you waiting there for a bit 
just did an introduction. You didn't miss much. Um, okay, so meeting your new fams. For the next three days, we're going to be a little family. And I want to make sure that you guys feel super safe. Um, and I find that happens when people, you know, just have a minute to say their name and what you hope to achieve from this training. You know, you don't have to get too detailed, just um, a short little introduction is great. And, you know, you can start, whoever's ready to start, please go ahead. <laughs> can start. <clears throat> Hello, ladies. I don't know if it's a gentleman here or everybody. Let's just say everybody. Um, my name is Marta Duke. I'm originally from Venezuela in South America, currently living in Florida. And uh, the reason why I'm here is I came across your account, um, Cassandra, through a friend of mine that we're both like advocates for mental health. And um, I just want to know more about your work uh, because I resonate with a lot of the stuff that you do and I have a similar background in terms of um, trauma and learning to heal my body. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what, what you have in store for us. Amazing. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. You know, and Jenny Martina, I'm from Venezuela too, but I'm probably living in Georgia. Also. So I'm here because I like your, the content that you post and I, read, I just find it interesting. But also because I have been dealing on, with some health issues related to stress, IBS, and uh, got uh, issues as well. So I'm really interested in learning uh, how you uh, help yourself with those things. Amazing. Amazing. I'm excited for you to dive into the content. Hi, I'm Julie. And um, I, I'm here to learn more about the nervous system. And uh, I think that that is at the root of my issues. I'm, I'm one of those people you were talking about that has dealt with SIBO. Um, I think I still have it and I've treated it multiple times and it just doesn't seem to go away. So uh, obviously I haven't um, addressed the root cause, which I think must be this autonomic nervous system. So I'm excited to learn more about uh, what you do and how to, how to solve this. Yes. Yes. That's so great. Thank you. Hi. I'm Ashley, um, similar background as everybody else, just came across your profile. Um, a lot of, like, I just feel like I resonate with your story. I also have SIBO. I'm currently in the process of treating it. Um, and the, you know, childhood traumas, I feel like are affecting my digestion and nervous system and everything. So I'm just here to learn the different tools and techniques. Amazing. Welcome. So nice to meet you guys because I see your names on Instagram and it's just lovely to feel your energy. Thank you for joining. Hi guys, um, my name is Morgan. Cassandra, I don't know if you remember, I actually did one of your workshops back in October um, and I'm really excited to reconnect. A lot has happened since then. Um, and so finally feeling like I have my, my feet under me a little bit and ready to do some of this work. Um, but I have had several gut and stomach issues for years and years and years. Um, and I think I had a, a little bit of a breakthrough in my last session with you when I realized like when I was little, I used to say my, my tummy is on fire um, and my mom is here and she can attest to that, right? And so it's like, why is my, why is my tummy on fire? Um, and have done a lot of work to try to heal that um, and be as aware as I can and doing the things that I can, but there's only, you know, so much that I know. So really excited to be here to learn more from you um, and, and start to implement some of these techniques and also really just do more of the research um, that I think, you know, I've tried to do in the past, but have gotten defeated when doctors have been like, no, no, you're like, you're not lactose intolerant. And I'm like, why do I go into a spiral every time I have dairy then? 
Um, so yes, excited. Sorry, that's my dog drinking water. Um, <laughs> she sounds like a horse <laughs> or a wild buffalo. Um, but really just excited to do this work. So thank you for, for being here to teach us. Yes, it's so good to see you again. You too. Who's next? Anybody else care to intro? No pressure. If not, that's totally fine. Uh, I was going to jump in and yes. since my daughter just spoke, um, she always gives me strength. So it's hard for me to talk about myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, child, childhood trauma still, I deal with it, but it's like, I just want it out of my mind and my body um you know you always say you have to let go and forgive I have a t very hard time with that um I am blessed with three amazing young adults and they are my teacher they've always been and um, I'm blessed to have them and to be here as well so thank you you. It's so great meeting you, Cassandra, and all of you here together. And I'm really looking forward to the next couple of days being together and learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh. Hey, Cassandra. Hey. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. Hey, I put my video back on. Um, Hey everyone, uh, first Cassandra, thank you so much for doing this. I've been following you. I came across your Insta, like a lot of other people have mentioned, like back in like 2019. Um, yeah, just similar experiences. Uh, there's IBS, unfortunately my late grandmother, my mom's mom had it and uh, family members as well. So I've kind of been dealing with that and I definitely see the connection between like stress and even like trauma and things I've been through in my life, um, depression, anxiety. Um, so yeah, I just want to learn more about the nervous system. And uh, I recently had an injury in the summer, which didn't help, which I think I reached out to you um, just dealing with uh, like a whiplash injury it was just so crazy how it happened, just bad luck, kind of fluke. And I ended up with like developing like really bad migraines. So that made me even more like getting back into like depression and even affecting my body again, right? Like digestion and just, you know, especially with the medications like that I had to take and I'm a lot better now. I'm still, you know, on a medication to help and other medications just to, you know, um, definitely help with that. But, um, yeah, just in general, want to learn more and I love your work and I'm happy to be here with everyone and, uh, just, you know, really again, you know, uh, break free of that stigma also for mental health and you know just the awareness and acceptance and everything so yeah just happy to be here thank you, thank you. to note on that um if you guys want to see any of my interviews from 2020 uh stigma effect campaign they're on my youtube channel so just go on be well with hope on youtube and there's tons of interviews with functional doctors that educates the uh talks about addiction and mental health and stigmas and root causes and all of that beautiful stuff so stay tuned in may is going to be the the next um month of interviews may 2021 thank you melissa good to see you thank you who's next Hi, my name is Hajar. Um, I've actually met Cassandra through a, uh, a friend of mine because um, I was looking for a homeopath slash um, nutritionist. And uh, I just recently saw that you're offering this course. So I'm excited to kind of learn more and hopefully continue using you as a holistic nutritionist. Thank you for offering this. Amazing. You're so welcome. I'm so glad you're here, Hajar. So glad you're all here. Is there anybody left? Did we go through... Last call, last call. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going to jump back into the 
the lecture. So again, I won't be able to see your faces now. If you have any questions, just turn your mic on, please. Okay, so we met the fam. Hi, fam. Beautiful to see you all. So I just want to do a group pledge so that everybody feels super safe with um, anything that they choose to share over the next three days. Um, if anybody has an issue with what I'm about to say, just let me know. I'm sure it'll be no issue, but here we go. As a group, we collectively uphold the safety of this container. I understand that the Nervous System Reboot Workshop works at a deep emotional level, and myself and my fellow students may decide to share personal information. At all times, I have the right to decide on the degree of my sharing and to ask for further explanation or support. In this workshop, I may be asked to explore my emotions, beliefs, and behaviors, which could result in a new level of awareness that takes me outside of my comfort zone. This program is not a substitute for professional mental health care or medical care. At any time, if you feel emotionally triggered to the point that feels out of your control, please seek the help that you need in the form of a professional therapist or contact myself and I will put you in touch with resources available. I also understand that the Nervous System Workshop is not providing health advice. I agreed to the following. I will hold strict confidentiality regarding all matters, names, events, etc., pertaining to the sharing of other participants in the group. I will not disclose information about another group member outside of the group verbally or through any written or electronic means, including email, Instagram, Facebook, and any other public forums, unless I have consent. I am aware that the Nervous System Reboot Workshop will be recorded, our sessions to be posted in the replay emails. If you would like the recording turned off during any sharing, I will advise the facilitator, or if I would like, uh, TNSN, TNSR facilitator will do my best, <laughs> I feel like the grammar's messed up there, to automatically turn off recording during sharing sessions. An important pillar of the Nervous System Workshop is the embodiment of the theory and bringing it into practice. Active participation will enable you to do this. I will do my best to attend the live classes and I understand that I get out what I put into the program. If there's any issues, you can turn your mic on, just let me know if you have questions or if you'd like to add any boundaries or asks, um, by all means. Okay, great, awesome. Okay, so what is trauma? This was a really big term for me to wrap my brain around. And if it's confusing to you guys, you are not alone. <laughs> trauma is defined by many different practitioners and leaders in the health world. They're kind of coining their own terms for it. And I think that's fine because it helps us to understand the complexities of trauma. Um, and it is really complex. It's not straightforward. So when we're thinking about trauma, I, I would say my favorite um, definition is from Dr. Gaber Mate. If you haven't heard of his work, I strongly uh, suggest looking even just on YouTube. You don't have to buy his book. Just start searching Dr. Gaber Mate videos. He is amazing talking about compassionate inquiry, self-inquiry as um, kind of a baseline approach to healing our traumas. The compassion piece being so important because as trauma victims, we tend to really judge our states and our emotions and our roadblocks. And healing doesn't come from a state of judgment, it comes from compassion. So learning his work and his definitions of trauma is, is really great. And he does amazing work in the world of addiction. Um, but he basically says that trauma is any time that we feel that we don't have a choice to protect ourselves when we're under threat. So we have to kind of escape our bodies, right? And we're going to talk about the, the polyvagal theory later on. And the polyvagal theory is um, the science behind these states that we get stuck in when we're living through trauma. Um, and it forms and reorganizes our brain and our nervous system. So this is where we get caught in autonomic nervous system dysregulation after intense stress and trauma. Some people talk about big T's and little T's. I don't like that shit. I don't like it. I think there's no big or little trauma. It's all trauma. And we never want to compare whether my trauma was as bad as others because that really keeps us stuck in silence and stuck in our trauma. 
Um, there's no comparison. So, you know, it could range from your parents not showing up to your baseball games to physical abuse or sexual abuse. And they're all relevant. It's all pain and it all sucks. So I really like to point that out so that because a lot of trauma victims really think, well, it wasn't that bad. Who am I to say that I was traumatized? Um, other people had it worse. And these are examples of how we learn to kind of abandon ourselves and not trust our emotions and not trust our experience. Um, so I'm a huge advocate for owning our trauma and not apologizing for it and to never compare, okay? I'm gonna give it just a little example of what people might say a big T versus a little T is. So a little T might be something like, oh, okay, I'll just use those same examples. Your parents not showing up for a baseball game. Big T is being something like a car accident, um, environmental disaster, or sexual abuse, okay? So you can see how I just don't think that there should be any separation, pain is pain. Um, okay, so let's start to get into the neuroscience. So your brain on trauma. There are three main parts. The triune model um, describes three main parts of the brain. And the part that we want to be occupying about 95% of the day is the neocortex, this blue part of the brain. This is all our gray matter. This is where, um, this is where we're separated from animals. Okay, so it allows us to have rational thinking. It's the newest part, the newest development of the nervous system. It allows us to have complex problem solving. That's when we can, you know, see a problem and actually work through it. This is where we're present to somebody in conversation and we can actually listen to what they're saying. I don't know if you guys dissociate or space ever, and that can be really frustrating. So we know that we're not activating the neocortex when that happens. Um, this is where we learn language. This is where we get creative. This is where we experience joy, connection, where, um, where we feel satiated and just happy. Like think of how often, when's the last time you felt consistently really satiated emotionally? and just really good, right? So that's helpful for us to understand that this part of the brain is not being activated if we're stuck in chronic stress. And the downstream effect, the issue with that when it comes to the body is that when we're not activating or living in the neocortex, we're not digesting food. We're not, di we're not detoxifying, okay? We're not problem solving. We're not resting and repairing. And these parts of the brain are what we're actually activating. So the limbic system is part of the lizard brain, okay? They work in tandem, the amygdala and the limbic system. So the amygdala is, is like your fire alarm, okay? So let's say you're walking down the street at nighttime, you're by yourself, it's all ladies here, and you see a big man walking down the street toward you and you don't like his gait, you don't like the way he's walking. Maybe he is something's just shifty. You can just sense his energy is off. Maybe that's where the amygdala starts firing. Okay. And it's saying warning, 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 upregulate stress hormones, shut down digestion, shut down detoxification because those processes take 80% of our calories. Okay. They're hugely, um, hugely caloric my grammar is so messed up in that. How am I trying to say it? They require a ton of energy. So the body says we need to make sure that energy is available to fight, possibly fight. And it goes into this automatic downstream of cascade of symptoms or, or processes, which is it secretes glucose from the liver into the bloodstream so that it can fuel a potential fight. And it also dilates your pupils and it opens up your bronchioles and your lungs so that you can run if you need to run. And that's where all the energy is funneled to, okay? So this is meant to happen about maybe 5% of the day. That's how our nervous systems have evolved over millions of years is to really just like 
activate that part of the brain when we're hunting an animal or we're being chased by something or we have to fend off or fight for our tribe and our safety. But ultimately the rest of the day we're hunting or we're gathering food, we're with our tribe, we're making love, we're doing art, we're, we're creating, right? So nowadays what ends up happening is when we wake up, we're stressed. We grab our phone, the EMFs, send signals into the body that confuse our cells, okay? Um, I'm not gonna get into EMFs in detail, but I really could <laughs> um, because they're hugely damaging, especially for people with infections. It creates about 600 times the biotoxin release, which is like biowarfare in our body. So we wake up, we check our phones, maybe we're rushing, the kids are slow, can't get them out the door. We go to a job possibly that's stressful or we don't like, or we're going through a hard time at work. There's traffic, there's emails, there's maybe being stuck in relationship with somebody who we feel trapped with. Um, that 95% is actually flipped. So we're 5% of the day nowadays, this is based on studies, we are 5% occupying the neocortex and 95% of the day we are activating these parts of the brain, which are keeping us in fight or flight, okay? So this is all automatic. When, when you walk down the street and you see that person who makes you feel unsafe, you're probably not aware of your body saying, oh man, I'm going into fight or flight, my digestion's shutting down, um, I'm activating my, my cortisol response, you know, we're thinking, okay, am I going to cross the street, right? Am I going, how am I going to protect myself? Do I have my cell phone close to me? So this is all unconscious patterning or, or um, like physiological responses. So what we want to do is start to notice what these symptoms are, and this is what we're going to be covering in the training, what the symptoms are of us being activated in a limbic system, or amygdala activation. Um, limbic system is when, like let's say, I don't know, I'm gonna give a personal example. I remember dating people when I was younger and just feeling really quite okay. Um, and then I went through some heartbreak and relationships after that heartbreak, certain words would trigger me, certain behaviors. Even though they had never given me a reason to not trust them, I was activated and I was alert and I was scared and I was defensive because the limbic system stores those past heartbreaks and traumas so that we can be hyper vigilant and aware of it potentially happening again. And we go into again an automatic response where we make these choices that are kind of behind the scenes, like it's not often conscious, right? So we might lash out, we might fight, we might judge, we might scream, right? We know that these heightened emotional reactions um, and even uh, like decreased emotional reactions where we become apathetic and we become depressed and disengaged. Um, these are all signs that the limbic system is being activated based on past experiences, okay? The reptilian brain is the oldest part of the brain, um, the lizard and the reptilian brain. They're old. They started when we were like crawling out of the oceans, right? Um, so the beautiful thing is that evolution, and we can kind of see it in society's behavior, in, in how, you know, people are, their consciousness is really rising. And I say that less with a, a note to like a nod towards spirituality and more toward consciousness in the sense that we're using this part of our brain more and more. We're having more complex thoughts. We're having more, you know, innovation. Um, all of these things are developing really, really rapidly. And it's an exciting time in the world because I think that those who are really starting to um, nurture this part of the brain through self-regulation, meditation, um, thinking ecologically, is this gonna be good for me, my family, the planet, the, the animals, et cetera? These are the thoughts that are helping to grow the brain, um, that part of the brain. So when we are, um, yeah, I was gonna, I don't wanna reiterate, but basically when you are activating these parts of the brain, 
all of your visceral organ function is slowed down or stopped. And think about what that does to us after many weeks, months, or years, or decades of being stuck in fight or flight, right? Being stuck in this trauma response constantly where life is so fucking irritating and so scary and like nothing, you don't feel safe. This is why we start to develop things like SIBO, IBS, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune disease, because our gut and our tissues are vulnerable to all of these environmental chemicals and pathogens that are entering our mouth through our fingers, our utensils, our food. We need to be in our neocortex in order to have a healthy functioning digestive system that can protect our body from threat. Okay, so when you're reviewing the slides afterward, just remember we have an old brain versus a new brain and its functions. Um, so reptilian brain, oldest part, uh, neocortex is the newest part. Now, uh, neuroplasticity is a thing. It's happening all the time, all the time. Your brain is completely plastic, but it loves pattern because it loves to conserve energy, creating new neural pathways it requires a lot of energy for the brain to go in that direction. It can be exhausting. So it doesn't just naturally go that way. We have to say, I'm ready to do these strategies and I'm committed to doing the practice to reroute neural pathways and occupy different hemispheres in the brain so that I can heal my body and I can heal my nervous system from being stuck in fight or flight. Okay, so remember, neuroplasticity is a thing. Everybody has it. Now, um, you know, stroke victims, they're able to have almost full recoveries because science has identified neuroplasticity and the techniques to use to help people have almost full recoveries. So you're capable, just know you're capable. Okay, and then a little bit of description more on the amygdala and the limbic system um, for you to review on. Oh yeah, I wanted to actually share some of the signs and symptoms of what limbic system impairment is. So I just short formed it here, LSI. So limbic system impairment is what happens when people go through trauma. Okay, and let me just pull up. So, okay, so focusing on pain and body checking, okay? How many of you guys scan your body for anything, for skin irritation, for disease presentations, for symptoms? That's a sign of your limbic system firing on all cylinders, okay? Assessing your environment, fortune telling, thinking that you can tell the future. I know that this is going to happen. Obsessing about the fear of chemicals um chemicals and foods negative thinking patterns mood changes negative self-dialogue believing that you cannot change because you are worse than anybody else okay like i can't change my shit's too bad i'm stuck here forever that's a sign of limbic system impairment lack of self-love living by your feelings addiction and addictive behaviors being the expert or comparing this program with other information blaming, just following others, complaining, okay, complaining. If we want to heal the brain and we want to heal our limbic system, we have to stop talking about the problem. Trauma-informed practitioners do not replay the problem. We really invite you to find self-regulation techniques and focus on the future and focus on the things that we need to feel safe as opposed to going back, because we're just reliving the trauma when we talk about it. It's reinforcing that neural pathway. Being stuck in the past, overanalyzing or spending too much time asking why, comparing your results to other people's results, defining yourself through the perspective of illness or your symptoms. Procrastination, think about procrastination. Maybe you don't, unconsciously, you don't feel that you're going to actually achieve what you need to achieve if you put the effort in. You don't trust yourself, right? This is a common, common issue. Needing to be in control, rushing, perfectionism. Yeah, but, right? That whole, yeah, but, the excuses. Over-responsibility for others and codependency. That's huge, guys. 
um, going back to old behaviors later that actually don't help. And, you know, there's probably tons more. And if you have more to add to that list as you're reflecting on these um, replays in the, the workshop, by all means, write them down because you want to be aware of them. I keep them in my phone and I check on them regularly so that I can be like, okay, how are you doing? How's your mental health? Where are you at? You know, it's just a really good little check-in point. Okay, so how to rewire the brain post-trauma. So this is something that practitioners just aren't talking about enough, in my opinion. Okay, we have a lot of meditation and mindfulness. We have a lot of, you know, therapy and trauma-informed therapy. But how much are they talking about the role that infections and chemicals, chemicals like, um, like heavy metal toxicity, let's say, or... Um, yeah, heavy metals would be a big one, environmental chemicals and toxins. They get stored and lodged in the body because remember when we're in chronic stress, our detoxification pathways, they shut down. So we become really, really toxic. And the issue with that is when we look at the body, where is it? Okay, so if we can imagine this is the body that's housing the infections and the heavy metals that are stored in these tissues. We have, um, part of the nervous system is, uh, not part, the nervous system will collect information from our, um, from our limbs and from our visceral organs and send information back to the brain that we're under threat when we have chronic infections and, uh, and toxicity. So, when we're not addressing the infections and the toxicity while using neuroplasticity to retrain and repair the brain, we have this constant steady stream of immune cells that are going to the brain signal signaling that we're under threat. And it's like the chicken or the egg thing. It's like, okay, now we're stuck in this cycle where we're just always in fight or flight because we're so toxic and we're dealing with infections. So it's so important that you work with a functional practitioner, uh, a functional nutritionist or a functional doctor who can help you to identify. Identifying through lab testing is so important. We don't wanna guess. It's expensive, I know, um, but so is being sick. So it's important that we establish, okay, we know what we're dealing with, and then you use the appropriate detox protocol. Make sure you work with somebody who has amazing testimonials. Make sure that they are willing to answer your questions and hear you out fully because detoxing from these things is no joke. You want to be supported and you want to know that if something arises, if symptoms arise, that you have somebody that you can trust to help you work through clearing them because it can, you know, progress isn't linear. It's not always a, an easy process. Um, yeah. And then number two, you wanna focus on your brain retraining and your vagal exercises, which we're gonna be covering in uh, days two and three. And then third, you wanna make sure that you're staying in your window of tolerance, okay? So a lot of us might feel like <clears throat> we get caught up in this tornado, this storm of emotion or this storm of drama. And that just keeps us stuck in that limbic system impairment. So a huge part of my personal recovery has been in ending relationships that were toxic and draining me, that were based in codependency, um, that people that didn't respect my boundaries and didn't hear me, I had to end them. And some of them were family members. And it was the hardest deci decision of my life, but it's been such a massive change in my energy and my available energy to create and grow and expand and develop because I'm not wasting energy trying to keep up with the drama and the trauma, right? So staying in our window of tolerance looks like this. So when we are hyper aroused, okay, we're in our trauma and drama and all of that, we're in fight or flight, it presents with symptoms like anxiety, overwhelm, chaotic responses, outbursts, anger and rage, rigidness and inflexibility, obsessive compulsive disorder, overeating and restrictions, as well as addictions. So think if like when I was an addict, well, I'm, I'm always an addict, but when I was in my addictions, I was so anxious, 
my autonomic nervous system was so dysregulated that I didn't produce the hormones to calm down those like neurotransmitters that were inhibitory. I couldn't calm down. So all I knew was addiction because I was raised around addicts. So we model what we grow up with. And I knew that I could become more social, more confident in how I spoke to people, more fun. People seem to like me more. Um, in social interaction seemed more available to me when I was high or drunk or both. So I have nothing but compassion for that part of myself, those, those decades, because I was doing my best to just be social and to just feel normal, right? So there are other ways that we can downregulate and come out of hyperarousal without using these responses or these behaviors to do so. Okay, and then hypo arouse is the freeze response, and we're going to get into uh, the polyvagal theory in just a sec. Um, so this is like feign death response. So if you've ever been in nature and you see like a critter, a frog, a spider, or something, and it sees you and it stops, it just plays dead. Squirrels do it. All animals do it. We all do it when we feel like we're under threat. Sometimes, depending on your nervous system and your conditioning you'll go into a freeze response. And this is a life-saving response. This is something that is programmed to keep us alive. But is it practical in this day and age to stay apathetic, to stay, stay dissociated and not present, unavailable, shut down, poor memory recall? You're just not accessing that prefrontal cortex where your memory is stored, where you're able to problem solve and be creative, right? Um, if you feel really disconnected, if you don't feel like you're, you're home in your body, if you always feel like you need somebody or something to feel okay, this is a sign of being out of your window of tolerance. Um, no display of emotion, apathy, um, all of the above are, are examples of being hypo aroused. Okay, so on day three, we're going to be talking about techniques and strategies to come out of that state. On day two, we're going to be coming uh, going through the techniques to come out of a hyper arousal. So the causes of us to go out of our window of tolerance is fear of things, fear of anything, unconscious thought, um, body feeling. So control, unsafe, like the feeling is um, needing to be in control, feeling unsafe, feeling like you don't exist and nobody sees you, nobody's validating you, nobody acknowledges you. Um, feelings of abandonment from partners or parents, friends, coworkers, rejection can be so triggering, definitely, and pull us out of that window of tolerance. Um, Trauma-related core beliefs about the self are triggered, and it causes emotional and psychological dysregulation. Okay, this is where we have to be really aware of our um, limbic system uh, symptoms so that we can go, ah, okay, I'm gonna go into my script and I'll teach you the script on days two and three. Okay, this is a neuroplasticity-based script to reroute brain pattern. And then to stay in our window of tolerance, we wanna make sure that we're practicing mindfulness. Um, we're focusing on the here and now. We're practicing our grounding exercises. We're using our tools to self-soothe. We're clearing infections. We're deeply breathing into our diaphragm and our belly, slowly. Okay, when we're breathing in our chest, we're definitely activating a different part of the nervous system that's more upregulating, um, kind of like we're anticipating threat. Um, we want to manage any limbic system uh, uh, presentations, and we want to make different choices. You know, the brain loves pattern. So we often stay stuck in these cycles of trauma because the brain is just kind of doing what it knows. So we have to access information and education new strategies, read books, hire a coach, watch YouTube videos. And then the scary part is jumping off the cliff of uncertainty and just making a new choice, creating that boundary, saying that thing that feels really fucking uncomfortable, being vulnerable and asking for what you need. And then do it with people who you feel safe with so that the response is going to be disconfirming. It's going to disconfirm what the brain believes, which is I'm not worthy of creating change. I'm not capable of creating change. I'm not worthy of having more self-esteem, et cetera. And that's how we start to change. The brain goes, oh, that person responded in a really good way. And that's disconfirming from that worst case scenario that I kept playing out. 
I can actually create those boundaries and I will survive and I will still feel love, right? So when we're in our window of tolerance, which is where we would like you to be about 90 to 95% of the day, that's the goal. Don't judge yourself if you're not there, right? We leave judgment at the door. Always replace judgment with self-compassion or compassion for others. Um, that's where I find the real healing is, is in, is in compassion. So we're in our comfort zone. We're emotionally regulated. We're just kind of watching life, observing, you know, we're noticing things, you're filtering it, but it's not really heightened emotion or inflammatory reactions to things. We're staying calm, cool, and collected, connected to people. We feel social. We feel open to love. Um, we want to see friends. We're cooking, we're eating, all of those beautiful things, okay? And we know our tools and techniques to self-soothe and to regulate our emotional state. So being in our window of tolerance, it actually allows us to have better relationship interactions because this is a social engagement system. We are social creatures. So when we're in one of the hyper or hypo aroused um, states, we're actually not engaging socially. In a, in a healthy way, other people pick up on our neuroses or pick up on our depression and it separates us. And that creates more reinforcement that we're alone, right? So we don't wanna tell ourselves that narrative. We don't wanna think and believe that we're alone because we're not, we're not. And it's up to us to get back into this window of tolerance by practicing all of our tools and techniques so that we can be socially engaged and have friendships, support networks, relationships that work that are healthy, where you feel validated and safe and loved, and, and just live life, right? Like go back to living life and being happy about where you're at. That's where we're aiming for, okay? So the big nerve that is, um, for the past 20 years, has been researched by Dr. Stephen Porges. He's the doctor who's kind of leading, one of the main doctors who's been kind of leading the way on, he first started researching babies and starting to understand um, why do certain babies, uh, this is so sad to say, but why do some babies die when they aren't um, being nurtured and loved and cared for, right? Um, that's when the nurses started to understand when babies are in, um, uh, like preemie babies, they need to have touch, they need to be held, they need to have voices around them, letting them know, hear their parents' voices. Because all babies have is their nervous system's ability to assess the environment for their mother's heartbeat, for threat, for tones of voice, for warmth and touch. And when, when we're not in those um, connections, we go into an inflammatory fight or flight response. And for some babies, that's just too much. But he furthered his research and started studying adults. And he came down, it came down to understanding that the cranial nerve X, our vagus nerve, is going to determine one of three states that we're in. Okay. And those states are, we're going to get into that in a sec. So this nerve is your queen nerve, okay? We want to love up on this nerve as much as we can, and there's many ways to do so. If you start researching vagal rehab, um, there's gonna be all kinds of stuff. Like you'll see YouTube videos, you'll see um, electro stimulation devices, some people who experience um, seizures and other chronic uh, neurological disorders, they'll actually get implants that will stimulate the vagus nerve throughout the day because it atrophies. This nerve is what's response. We need this nerve to be highly responsive to our environment and it atrophies. It, it, it becomes less responsive when we're always fueling that fight or flight response. Okay. Cause we're just nurturing that neural pathway versus nurturing a more calming um, parasympathetic pathway. So your parasympathetic pathway is where you're resting and digesting. You're in your window of tolerance. Life is groovy. Your fight or your sympathetic pathway is where you are um, in your fight or flight and digestion shutting down. So you can see that this nerve, it innervates with a ton of important visceral organs, right? So when it's not functioning properly, how are you going to digest, uh, um, secrete the digestive juices needed to break down proteins in the gut and protect you from um, 
any pathogens that are entering the mouth and entering our body, right? When we're stressed out, we're not producing the digestive juices, the hydrochloric acid to protect the body. So then the infections and everything starts to make its way into our lungs, down, and it passes through into our small intestine. Um, it affects our kidney function, which is major for detoxification. Our pancreas isn't secreting the enzymes to break down fat, carbohydrates, and uh, protein. And we just start to putrefy food in the gut. It becomes, it rots in the gut and it feeds infections. And when that's left for a long period of time, that's where we start to get all kinds of diseases or autoimmune presentations, okay? Same with the liver. You know, how many people are developing type 2 and type 3 diabetes now? Um, this all has to do with dysregulated organ function because the autonomic nervous system is dysregulated. We're, stu we're stuck and trapped in this fight or flight response, okay? So the polyvagal theory is where we start to observe human behavior and human um, presentations uh, that show us we're in one of those three vagal responses. Okay, so the dorsal vagal response is where we're depressed, we're apathetic, we collapse, maybe we're lying in bed. Um, you might see like in movies or maybe you've experienced this, just such a fit of rage that they fall to the ground. Dissociation, so that might be just totally not being present, not connected to our body, not knowing if we're in pain, not knowing, you know, when people are like, oh, I, you know, they just seem so connected to themselves. And you're like, I don't feel that. You could be in dissociation. Um, freeze response. I remember once there was a tornado outside of my bedroom window that was open in the forest. I was living in the, in the country and there was this huge forest outside of my house. And this mini tornado went through and it, it twisted the tree outside of my door. And it was about a year after I had left a very abusive, physically abusive home. It was very loud, lots of loud noises. And I was just a kid. I was 13 years old. It woke me up. The noise sounded like people banging on my door and screaming. I thought my family was being attacked. And I froze and I couldn't go back to sleep. My eyes were up just wide open looking at the ceiling and I couldn't move my body. And I remember waking up and I didn't even tell anybody that that was happening because it was just so strange. I was so out of, so confused and disconnected from my body. Looking back, I was fully in a trauma response from that noise. Um, and then decreased organ, visceral uh, organ function. So our visceral organ function doesn't only decrease when we're hyper aroused, it also slows down when we're hypo aroused. So that's why depression is painful, right? It's painful, physically painful. Um, and then we go into the mobilized response. So this is where we're in fight or flight. You know, we've covered this a lot now, but I like re repetition so that it's super clear on why you're chronically ill because you've been chronically stressed, okay? So decreased digestion. You can take all the digestive enzymes. You can eat all the special diets. But if you're stuck in fight or flight, you're going to keep having digestive issues and food intolerances and constipation and all of the things. Um, sluggish detoxification, we're not eliminating toxins. Decreased cellular function, this is also not talked about enough. Mitochondrial function, so your cell's ability to um, take in nutrition and, and uh, antioxidants and push out toxicity efficiently, it becomes really skewed. It's like it's like electrocuting your cells and they just get, they just scatter and things aren't functioning properly. That's just things aren't coming in and out. The issue with this is also decreased fat absorption because the digestive system is slowed down so much that we're not actually digesting and absorbing our poly and monounsaturated fats that surround each and every single cell in the body that allows the fatty lipid, you know, um, uh, kind of container that each cell is in that allows for nutrition to come in and toxins to go out. So things just get stuck and our cells become toxic and we start holding water because there's so much toxicity in our body that the body's trying to protect uh, our DNA from damage by holding water. Okay, so if you're chronically holding uh, water retention, this is part of it. So one thing that I really love to use for that is phosphatidylcholine 
making sure that you're eating really healthy sources of fat and taking a bile supplement or some type of like bitters supp supplement to stimulate bile release so that you're actually digesting and absorbing those fats and supplying them to the cells so that we can detox and we can think and get up and move. And, you know, the brain really struggles when we have decreased cellular function and decreased fat absorption because the brain needs those fats and nutrients to function, right? And poor glucose balance. So I touched on that, but we, you know, we go into that state of secreting uh, glucose from the liver into the blood. Now, anybody who has insulin resistance, um, anybody who has okay no problem no problem um, anybody who has <clears throat> um, type 2 diabetes uh, insulin resistance unexplained weight gain and weight retention we're definitely looking at poor glucose balance due to our cells just being burned out um, not producing enough insulin or the cells just the enzymes or the attachment is just burned out. It can't keep it in. Uh, sorry, one moment, people. If you need to talk, just please go ahead. Um, so we end up developing insulin resistance, poor glucose absorption and metabolism, and then we're depending on our genetics, we'll start to present with, um, you know, type two diabetes or insulin resistance. And then our ventral vagal state, this is when we're in our window of tolerance. This is when everything is so good. Social engagement, we're able to make eye contact, our organs are functioning. We can recall memory and focus on a task at hand. How many of you during the pandemic have felt like, I just can't fucking concentrate, I can't think? Um, my work is suffering or my relationships are suffering because they're saying, you know, you're not present, you're not paying attention. And it's like, well, I'm in survival mode. You know, I'm not thinking about being present to your conversation. My body is trying to survive. So we really want to get into our ventral vagal state there. Problem solving, happiness, joy, and creation. Okay. So this is the polyvagal theory. And we want to use our self-regulating techniques from day two and three to keep pulling ourselves back here from any of these responses. One really interesting point that I want to make out to those of you who feel like you might have dissociated from your pain and your trauma um, and your body so much to the point that you're stuck in a depressive state. You want to get to ventral vagal, but you're stuck in dorsal vagal because you can't get to ventral unless you move through mobilized. So unfortunately, you have to feel the pain in a safe environment okay you want somebody to help you to understand the mindset and the boundaries and the aftercare that comes with actually feeling our past pain when we're triggered we have to feel it to release it if you've heard that saying before this is the science behind that saying okay so to get out of depression and dissociation we have to start to feel and then the nervous system will be able to access the ventral vagal response Okay, um, does anybody want to take a little break? Like a five minute, if you want to go have a pee and... Five, five minute break. Okay, yeah. sure that works. Yeah, I need to okay. pee. I'll take a five minute. I'll see you at 12.15, uh, okay? Sounds great, okay, thank you. No problem.
How's everybody doing with the content so far? Good. Cassandra, I have a question. Can well, you hear me? Yes. Um, I was just wondering what time do you think this will end? I have a 1030 call that I'm supposed to be on, but I could maybe let them know I'm going to be late depending on how long. Yeah, so we have about three slides left. So I'd say about uh, 15 minutes. Okay, that's good then. Okay, I'm glad you can stay. Okay. All right. It's, uh, I said 12.15. I know I'm an hour behind Eastern Standard Time, so um, I keep making that freaking mistake. <laughs> I'm like, stop it. Um, so let's jump back in. Let's jump back in. Hope you all had a good break. Okay, so the HPA axis is the hypopituitary adrenal axis. And this is basically the relationship between the brain and our adrenals and our stress response. Does anybody, does anybody have a mic on? You can make sure you're, you're mute. Yeah, mute it up. Thanks, Julie. Um, so, this is giving a, a bird's eye view of what's happening when we experience stress. So stress comes in in whatever form it comes in, okay? It could be that, that afferent signaling, that 80% of afferent information going to the brain because of infections or, you know, if any of you guys saw my post about breast implant illness, um, I was not a good candidate for implants. So probably implants of any kind, like if I were to break a bone and get a plate and screws put in, that would probably cause um, an afferent uh, immune regulator, uh, sorry, an afferent signal to my immune system that I'm under threat. And it would keep, it kept me in fight or flight. It kept me sick and inflamed. And a lot of things resolved when I took those implants out. So stress on the body into the brain. The brain, the hypothalamus, will send uh, neurotransmitters and hormones down into the pituitary. Um, the pituitary then signals to the adrenal glands to upregulate cortisol. So for any of you ladies who experience PMS, okay, PMS of any kind, uh, bloating, cramping, pain, emotional dysregulation, um, uh, weird bleeding patterns, um, lack of sex drive, it's caused by the, well, often, most often, it's caused by this response happening so frequently that when the adrenal glands are producing cortisol, that's your life-saving hormone. It's an anti-inflammatory hormone that we need in order to stay alive, um, much more than progesterone. And progesterone is your estrogen anchoring hormone. It's anti-inflammatory. It really helps us to stay in a beautiful, healthy state, especially around our menses. So if we're in a chronic stress state and the body's saying, well, I'm going to give the building blocks to cortisol because that's a life-saving hormone, guess what doesn't get fed? Right? It's your um, progesterone hormone production that atrophies. And then we present with estrogen dominance. So if anybody's told you, oh, you're estrogen dominant, it it, yeah, BPAs and environmental chemicals definitely affect um, our estrogen dominance, but it's largely due to being in this stress state, not producing enough progesterone, and paired with sluggish liver detoxification of hormones. So we have this buildup of hormones, of estrogen, and we start to present with all of these high estrogen symptoms. And for we're not meant to go through menopause painfully. You know, this is a sign that we've been living under a lot of stress and we haven't produced enough um, progesterone and our liver detoxification has really been sluggish for a long time. Okay. Kidney function is affected and that really is hard on the body because the kidneys are responsible for major detoxification. And we start to see these metabolic effects. So metabolic dysfunction where people are trying to, like I was a personal trainer for years and people would come in with metabolic dysregulation, 
because of this chronic stress response and they thought that they had to go on a really hyper restrictive diet and exercise intensely five days a week which is only going to stress the body out more so they look at me like i was nuts when i was like no we're going to work out less we're going to focus on getting you in your window of tolerance upregulating detoxification rest and repair stress management making sure you have access to plenty of food the right kinds no restriction and your movement is going to be um it's going to be restorative movement right get out of the mindset that crossfit or heavy lifting is going to get you the body that you want i would also question that mindset is that a trauma response right it's more about loving and nurturing our body having compassion for our symptoms not trying to force it into anything that it's not ready to do and it really is about guys healing from complex trauma and, and intense stress it's really about learning how to reparent ourselves to be the parent that we wish we had who could hear us who could love us who could nurture us and give us the boundaries from pain and and toxic people that we deserve right so it's definitely uh as i've mentioned very complex but totally doable and it's it's one of the biggest honors I've ever had in my life is to stop the intergenerational trauma patterns that have been handed down to me generation to generation, to stop it and to spend my very valuable resources, which have been time and money, to learn how to show up for myself in this way so I can stop the physical illness and stop the emotional pain of trauma. Okay. Um, so on day two and three, we're, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing the neuroplasticity based program and we're going to go over the script and the script, you're going to be provided a document with it. I would love for you to save that on your phone or copy and paste it into your notes, carry it with you at all times, and you're going to use it daily for the next six months. That's how research has shown for people to heal their trauma. It's the most effective trauma healing program on the market. McMaster, McMaster University in Ontario did amazing studies on this program. And it showed that it was the most effective at reversing PTSD and complex PTSD. So both for veterans and for children or people who have experienced complex trauma um, to reverse those symptoms. So you wanna use it morning and night for 30 minutes. I'll go over it tomorrow, don't worry. Um, and any time that you notice that you're triggered, right? You go into the script and that is what reroutes the neural pathways. It's all self-directed brain retraining. Okay. Nobody's going to download it for you. We have to download the system ourselves by doing the work. Okay. And it works. It works. It works. It works. It's the craziest thing I've ever done in my life. And I love it because it's science-based. I'm not super into just like mantras and praying to heal. I'm like, I want science-based, evidence-based strategy that is going to show results right so that's what we're going to get into tomorrow um i'm so excited <laughs> it's such a great tool um vagal toning exercise so we can override our nervous system by activating the vagus nerve with these tangible techniques daily okay so when you're brushing your teeth you're going to do it morning and night and i'll show you them tomorrow um to strengthen our queen nerve and optimize our our body's function Okay, and then we're also on day three going to go into um, upregulation and downregulation techniques. So we're going to cover the um, techniques to use when we're out of our window of tolerance in either direction so that you can gain control. Like you guys saw the emails coming in. I was confused on what time it was today, and I noticed that there was like a glitch in my back end tech stuff. And I noticed I was holding my breath and I, my tummy was getting tight. and I it was like pinhole vision. I just started being like, oh my God, I don't have enough time. And I started doing the vagal toning exercises and I grounded. It worked immediately. So in the moment when we're out of our window of tolerance, we have access to tools that we can use so that we're, you know, it's not about never being triggered. It's not about never being anxious or depressed. It's just saying, hey, I know that this is part of being human. I know that this is a response of my nervous system that's here to help me but I know that chronically it's not helpful. So I'm gonna step in with these techniques to nurture and coax my nervous system to go back into a healthy state, a healing and anti-inflammatory state. Okay, so I'm really excited for day two and three. <laughs> um, 
right just before we get into q a some tools that i use to monitor my biofeedback so if you're somebody like me who has been very dissociated from your body for a long time it might be hard to tell when you're in either of those states um, a dorsal or a mobilized state so hrv tracking is amazing a lot of high endurance athletes will use it to optimize their training and recovery but a lot of trauma victims are using it now too. And there's different devices that you can buy. They range from like $16 all the way up to $500. Um, the $500 ones I would only recommend doing if you are a high performance athlete because it helps with your training. But the $16 one is an app called the HRV4 Training. HRV number four training. And it's a $16 app on, um, on your, in your app store. And you want to do a daily HRV tracking. You uh, establish a baseline after four days, and then every day after that baseline, your, your heartbeat will actually tell you whether you're in a healing state or an inflammatory state. And then you can decide, okay, is today the day that I, I have that tough conversation with that person, or that I do that intense workout? Maybe not. Your HRV never lies. It will always tell you, where your nervous system is at that day. So I use it, you know, when I arrived in Costa Rica, my HRV was really low and we want it high. So I didn't, I didn't do any exercise. I rested, I slept as much as I needed to, just took it easy. And now I'm back up to about a seven, it's slowly creeping up, but I know that I can't be overly exerting because it's just gonna put my body back into that stress state that feeds that fight or flight response. If you're waking up between two and four, Every night, it's one of two things in my experience. Um, you didn't eat enough well-balanced meals throughout the day or you weren't absorbing the beautiful nutrition you were eating, so low blood sugar, or heightened cortisol response. So your cortisol is rising too early. It should start rising around five and it starts rising around two and then we wake up. So it, you know how you're sleeping will really tell us whether you're in a stress state or a, um, or a ventral vagal state. Mood and behavior, so if you're anxious, if you're depressed, if you're irritable, if you're intolerant, if you are going back into addictive patterns, um, if you're you know, scrolling nonstop on your phone, these are all signs that you're out of your window of tolerance. Is it to say that you should judge yourself for doing those things? Not at all. I'm a huge advocate for people doing what they feel they need to do to feel safe in that moment. I have no tolerance for judgment of any coping mechanisms that people use. I think it all is understandable. Um, that person just needs compassion and love and safety and not judgment. And that means from yourself as well, right? And I always judge my openness to experiencing love. So if I'm really afraid of love, if I'm not dating, if I'm not getting crushes, um, also friendships, if I'm not letting people in, if I'm not connecting with my family, these are all signs that I'm out of my window of tolerance. So these are just a few really inexpensive, if not free ways to be able to track where you are. Okay. Um, and that's it. So time for q and I would love to hear your guys' questions and I'm definitely available for the next, where are we? for the next 30 minutes or so to have a really good conversation about this stuff. So feel free. So thank you so much. Uh, I just find this information so interesting. Uh, I was wondering this quick, you just told us, are you gonna send it to us? The script week to practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're going to cover it tomorrow and I'm going to send you okay. a PDF as well as all of the signs and symptoms that I, um, that I listed earlier of being in limbic system impairment. So you can save that on your phone and study it. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. I have a question as far as getting started with some of these tests. So you and I had chatted a little bit um, and going into the doctors to start with some of these tests or doing them um, a little bit more holistically just 
for getting a baseline to really understand like what we're working with, what are your suggestions to start with? Because I'm sure once we start, there's going to be a lot to do, yeah. um, but just curious how to, how to get that ball rolling. So the functional labs, you mean, to assess like mm-hmm. infections and toxicity? Okay. Yeah. Um, so generally, I say a comprehensive stool analysis through Genova Labs. Um, that's going to tell us how well your digestive organs are functioning, and it's specific to gallbladder, pancreas, stomach. And then it will also tell us which bacteria is out of, um, you know, out of control. Um, if there's any parasites and ova, if there's any candida, uh, yeast, uh, intestinal yeast, and then it also tells us what they're resistant to. So we don't use the wrong herbs and medication to treat. Um, it also tells us if there's any possible inflammatory bowel disease. So it'll give us markers of things like Crohn's and colitis, celiac disease. Uh, they're not diagnoses, but it's just kind of like a, uh, you might want to investigate this kind of marker. That's my general go-to. But if somebody has had exposure to mold and or um, environmental chemicals, so I have one client who was a um, TTC driver for 25 years straight. She developed type 2 diabetes. She had resistant um, fat retention. She just could not get rid of it and was diagnosed with heavy metal toxicity. So now she's on a chelation protocol. So really it depends on the intake. Once I see the intake, I'll say, okay, if there's mold and exposure to environmental chemicals, we're gonna do a mycotox profile through uh, Great Plains Labs. And that'll tell us which mold is in the body and how to treat it, um, as well as environmental chemicals. But generally it's the stool analysis. That's fascinating. Um, And I know I'm curious too, with that in mind, do you need to see a doctor for a stool analysis? Is there something you can, or like a kit you can order online? Because I know, I hate to say it, like I don't want it to sound weird, but there are kits for everything. Like I got something for food testing yesterday and it's like, test to see if you're this, test to see if you're that. So like, what what would you suggest um, to do the stool analysis? Yeah. So you need um, a designated practitioner to requisition it for you. I can requisition it for you. Um, Even though I'm in, I was going to say, even though I'm in Canada, (laughs) even though I'm outside of the US, um, I can requisition the American lab and it would be sent to your house um, with the instructions. And then you, you complete the test and we get the results back in about two weeks. Um, I get the results and then we book an appointment to go over them and I describe what it, what's coming up and what we're going to do to fix it. Amazing. Okay. Thank you. Definitely want to chat with you about that. Yeah. Anytime. Anytime. You have my number. Great questions. I, I have a question. This is Julie. Hi, Julie. Um, Hi, you, you mentioned this, um, was it the neuroplasticity-based programming? I think that's probably what I need. Um, and it's 30 minutes every day, twice a day? Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Brain, and, brain gym. Okay. <laughs> Does that involve, um, you're going to be saying something for 30 minutes, the script? Is that... Is yep. that like kind of like meditation, but you're saying something? Okay. You're okay. saying something and you're also trying to emote something. So synapses in the brain, which are like new pathways, they strengthen when we attach emotion to it. So mm. think of the emotion that's released when we go through trauma and stress, right? That really strengthens that pathway. So mm-hmm. it's really hard for trauma victims to visualize and feel joy and connection and happiness. So mm-hmm. it's a little hard at the beginning, but you just, even if you have to try on somebody else's joy and you try and feel it, what's the color? What does it feel like? Where is it in my body? Because that emotion will signal to the brain, hey, let's go over here and like hang out here more. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll cover that in tomorrow's lecture too. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I'm excited for you to start it. <laughs> yeah, so just so if I normally spend time meditating, what, would I do this instead? Then instead of the meditation? I mean, you um, might want to do both. Whatever meditation does for you, it you know, it it's up to you. Um, 
meditation might just be a beautiful space for you to experience it, nothing. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. And it's just, and it's a way to practice my breathing because I tend to do the real shallow breathing and have lots of anxiety. And so it, I think it's good for me to do, maybe even if I just did a couple 10 minute sessions just to close my eyes and, you know, if I can fit that in, I'm just wondering, you know, time management wise, like how do I prioritize all these things? So I'll say this, I had heart palpitations when I was, I was living with my parents after the pandemic started and living with my parents was not a good idea because it was just re-traumatizing. Um, but I was having heart palpitations that, you know, woke me up in the morning. It was just so uncomfortable. And I went into the script and after three rounds of doing the script, my heart palpitations were gone for the whole rest of the day. So you might notice that your breathing changes, that you might not need to practice breathing so much that you'll just be able to access deeper diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, good. Okay. That's good. Right. Yeah. 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 It changes our physiology. It's like, you know, that whole thing of like what you think is, it, it becomes you is, I kind of have an issue with that saying, but it's also kind of true. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? Okay. Right. And then with the heart rate, HRV tracking, you, we could just get the app and then would you put headphones on and you just like listen to it or you just no. sit there? No. It's so <laughs> All it is, is um, when you open the app, it'll say, okay, put your finger over your camera and it will show mm -hmm. you, like if, you're, if your finger's not in the right place, it'll show you, so you adjust it. And you just hold it there. It'll count for, I think, 60 seconds. And what HRV is doing, it's different than heart rate. So HRV is the time in between your heartbeats and all of the variation of mm -hmm neural responses because it will tell us how quick our parasympathetic um, nervous system to allow for the heart to relax and then the sympathetic system is what allows it to contract so that time in between tells us a lot about your response to stress so once you just put your finger on there for 60 it spits out a reading and you're like okay my parasympathetic system is working great today i'm going to be a little bit more gung-ho in my workout or maybe i'll do more errands today um, if it's really low, it means your response to stress is not good and you might want to take it easy that day and do okay. like, more vagal toning practices, more breathing, more meditation, more Epsom salt mm -hmm. bath, self-care. Okay. Okay. So it just helps you manage your stress better and your, your, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like giving you some data, some biofeedback to understand when to implement certain boundaries. Yeah. Do you find though when people are first starting out that it might always be low mm -hmm. and, until they do some work? Yeah. Yep. Okay. yep. Definitely. Yeah. However, it shows up, it just it is what it is, right? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and then you just take that that info and run. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Can I just ask what the name of the app is? It's HRV Number Four Training. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's an Italian trainer, or uh, I think he's like a, yeah, he's a trainer, but he's like a high performance coach or something. And he created this. It's the only app on the market that is um, actually proven to get a proper HRV reading because the devices to buy them are normally between 115, like heart matter. Um, or I think it's the Heart Math in Institute, they have a device that you can wear. And that one's about 150. And then there's the um, Aura Ring that you wear 24 seven and it helps to monitor sleep, but it also gives a really good reading. That's 350. And then there's uh, the Garmin um, watch and that's around 500. Um, and it gives you, it's just really complex. So I think it's more for people who need it for training. You don't need to spend 500 bucks. And I have with a this app, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Let, let's finish with the app. You go ahead. It's okay. something else. <laughs> okay, just quickly with this app, you don't have to wear anything. It's just the phone that tracks it. Yeah. Yeah. You just place your finger over the camera and what it's doing is the light is really bright. 
it'll like shine your flashlight and it'll pick up your heartbeat and to a point where it's able to pick up all the variations um, of your nervous system. So it's really, I think it's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Denica? Yes. Um, so I know we touched a little bit on the adrenal support. Um, my question is for you, would you, is your opinion to maybe get tested first? Like you think it's harmful to just take adrenal support, even though you're not like, I, I know my adrenal support is not good right now. Should I go get a supplement for it? Or is it important to get tested to make sure that maybe my levels are off? I think uh, testing for adrenal fatigue is a waste of money, in my opinion. Yeah. And I almost think that, not almost, I do think that treating adrenal fatigue is treating the limbic system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really, if you're just doing the script morning and night, and whenever you're triggered and feeling stress come on, um, that's getting to the source. So instead of trying to put on a band aid on the adrenals, mm -hmm. you're actually just going right to the source that's going to stop activating through that HPA axis. It's going to stop mm -hmm. activating the adrenals and the cortisol response. And then you'll just find that your adrenals have a chance to recover and just be okay. So how long would you recommend like doing that? Like several months or six months. like six months? Yeah. Yeah. The data, the research was on six months of daily use for an hour a day. Plus when you're triggered. Um, for neuroplasticity to take effect and change organ function. So in the meantime, there's no harm in taking adrenal support just to help. But I would mm -hmm. say like investigate, because a lot of these supplements can be really expensive. And I would say investigate things like CBD, curcumin, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, Wim Hof breathing. I take, that, I take that every day to start with. So I do take it several times a day, which definitely helps. It helps, yeah. Wim Hof breathing. Um, he has a great app. I don't know if you've heard of him before, but he's the Iceman, I think his name is. And Wim Hof. Oh yes. Okay. Now I know who that is. Yes. I have him on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. He's, I think he's hot. I'm like, you're great. Yeah. He's pretty great. <laughs> you know? um, but he, he has a free app and it has a visual. So it's like this ball that expands and contracts so that you can visually keep up with the breathing and he coaches you through mm -hmm. it. You only need to do like one to three rounds in the morning when you first get up. And that okay. really, like, I, I don't want to be gross, but I'm going to be a little bit gross right now. <laughs> when I started Wim Hof mm -hmm. breathing, um, parasites started to come out of my stool. Yeah. And I've wow. never seen that before. So it upright. I've honestly had a lot of parasites too, for some reason. I don't know why my body likes parasites. Like I've had H. pylori several times. I've went to Costa Rica, drank some water, got a parasite there. So my body, um, I, I find the H. pylori was really hard on my body with the antibiotics they gave me and they had to give it to me several times. Um, and that's when I, that was when I had my first child, he's eight now, but I was so small, like that no one could figure out what was wrong with me. And it was H. pylori. And since then I've kind of, I've never been the same. Yeah. Yeah. H. pylori is, um, I think 50% of the global population has it, but oh, only, really? yeah, but only, you know, I don't know what the actual data is on how many percent with extreme H. pylori symptoms. Um, mm -hmm. some people are asymptomatic and they carry it, but when you're really feeling it like that, it is so disruptive. Like I know it just takes a toll on your stomach and your immune system. Um, yeah. I know it's a tough one. So if you're not fully resolved yet, I would anticipate that it's, um, co-infections. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, when we're like, oh, I, I got a parasite. Well, we have tr trillions of parasites. Mm -hmm. It's just whether they have the opportunity to actually become pathogenic. And that's because we're chronically stressed, our beneficial bacteria die off, um, the gut becomes inflamed, food putrefies in the gut, and it becomes like a perfect buffet for, um, for pe bye, bye Morgan, I'll, see, I'll speak to you soon. It becomes a perfect breed, breeding opportunity for not only parasites, but viruses and bacteria and fungi. Mm -hmm. So when somebody gets diagnosed with an infection, I'm usually like, 
okay, well, let's clear this infection and chances are we're gonna find more along the path. And I like to say that not to scare people, just to have real talk, because I was a patient too. And I wish my functional practitioners had said to me, okay, we're gonna clear SIBO, and then we're probably gonna have to address fungus and candida, and then we're gonna have to address Epstein-Barr virus that's leading to your tics and your uh, nervous system issues, right? It's very common for people to have many infections, and it's just about riding the wave and finding that window of tolerance and accepting that this is what's happened after chronic stress. And then mm-hmm. nurturing ourselves through that stress and through the process of detoxing. Yeah, great. Yeah. I'm definitely going to start the adrenal support and I'm going to send you a private message after because I'd love to chit chat and work with you. Of course, by all means, I, I would love to chat and work with you too. Definitely. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for joining. Feel free to stick around if you want to um, hear some more uh, questions. And Diana, um, it's Wim Hof, so it's W I M H O F F, like Frank. It's the Wim Hof breathing method. Um, I want to point out this is an important piece. Also, some trauma victims don't feel safe being in their body. Um, breath, being with your breath, being with stillness. The Wim Hof breathing is quite. Um, expansive it's it's like it's not a calming breathing thing it's actually really like (gasps) it's almost it feels almost like hyperventilation but you're sending the breath into the deep uh, part of the gut versus up here and I just want to point out that if you don't feel like that's an available technique or any of the techniques feel triggering to you do not force yourself to do it please don't judge yourself we just need to find another tool for you that's all it is okay we want to nurture that that little baby limbic system that's really afraid of being not perfect and not able to do it. We want to just have compassion for that and not judge our our process, right? Diana, you're so welcome. Um, Oh, and then I see Charmaine here. Been recovering from topical steroid withdrawal syndrome for the past year from a car accident, brain injury. My sleep has been thrown off. Yeah, so vagus nerve, vagus nerve, vagus nerve. Charmaine, if you're still with us, Uh, I think you are. Um, Vagal toning exercises are going to really, really help with your sleep and really help to repair your nervous system. You know, we don't really have to, like we do have to do stuff to help our bodies heal because we get to this place where things are just so dysregulated that our um, negative feedback loops are thrown off. And when we empower the parts of the body like the vagus nerve, to really shine, that's when we're in a healing state. When we're, when we're in our parasympathetic state, we're in our healing state. And the body just knows what to do. So the more you can activate, like, you know, you cut your finger, it knows how to heal. It's that innate. Like, y- you'll heal. You guys will heal. I promise you, if you keep doing the work and you stay consistent, stay in your window of tolerance, keep loving up on yourself, um, the healing does come and I'm speaking from experience, you know? Um, so yeah, I know, I mean, not only is car, our car accidents, um, traumatic, but then we also have the, the physical, um, after effects that need to be rehabbed. So I hear you, you know, sleep definitely gets disrupted in that situation. Um, a product I really like, it's expensive, Charmaine, but, um, Expensive is about 100 US a bottle, and that will last a month, but it's called Parasim Plus, P-A-R-A-S-Y-M Plus, and it's by a company called, you know what, if you can't find it, just let me know. I actually have a link. Um, I'll send it out in the email for, it it gives like, I think it's 15% off. Um, And what it does is, it supplies the vagus nerve with the neurotransmitters, the building blocks that it needs to uh, function properly. So people notice that they feel way more balanced emotionally without putting much effort into it. They sleep better and their digestion improves and periods improve. Oh, interesting. Cause I've been taking um, GABA. Mm-hmm. Actually, I feel like at least 10 or 15 supplements um, after both 
situations and I'm never really sure about like compounding or if there's any like, yeah. counter interactions or am I possibly taking too much um, yeah. and just because yeah, there's like each uh, condition required different healing mechanisms or supplements um, yeah yes I always recommend working with a practitioner to oversee um, your supplements and interactions mm -hmm. And if that's not available to you for whatever reason, you can always check out medscape.com. It's either medscape.com or .ca. And you can check out drug interactions. So um, when you put the name of the supplement or, or drug in there, it will tell you what the contraindications are, if any. Can you spell it again, please? What's that? Can you spell the name of the app, the website to check yeah. the drug interaction? Yep, it's Medscape, so M-E-D-S-C-A-P-E, -E. and I can't remember if it's dot .com, I think it's dot .com. Because I'm actually on the uh, looking up treatment, parasite, G, so I'm taking a lot of things, uh, so I just was wondering if I can add these yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Yeah, I think, you know, we often, and I say this as your, like, like I'm right there with you guys as a patient, you know, I've been through chronic infections and brain injuries from trauma. Um, I know how expensive things get and overwhelming it gets. And yeah. I just want to point out at the end of the day, if you work with somebody who knows what they're doing and they can really give you proper long-term care, like a short, medium and long-term plan, you're going to save more money and time in the long run. So instead of trying to self-diagnose and self-treat, I'm not sure if you're doing that. I don't want to assume that you are, but um, if you're unclear as, as to whether no, no. too much, um, I would consider working with somebody that you trust and you know can really help you because mm -hmm. sometimes people get Herxheimer reactions, which is a really nasty reaction from detoxing and it activates genetic predispositions for illness. So we want to make sure we're avoiding things like that, that your body's not retoxifying, like you can stimulate toxins to come out. But if your detox pathways are sluggish, which is often really common, yeah. And you're not getting them out and you're just recirculating the uh, exposure to toxins. So um, it's a bit of an art form. And if it feels overwhelming doing it yourself, it's because it is. Like people go to school for this and specialize. And, you know, I say that with, with empathy and compassion to the overwhelm financially that comes with being chronically ill. I know it's a lot. Yes, no, we definitely need the help. Yeah, yeah. Thank and you. ask, you know, guys, if finances are an issue, because a lot of times when we're chronically ill, we don't have access to, to the energy to work. Um, ask for a sliding scale. Ask if somebody's willing to lower their rates for you. Um, and oftentimes people will. You know, many practitioners will have space for sliding scale. Yeah, we don't Sorry, want to can I just ask what the name of that supplement was again? Uh, Parasim Plus. Is that the one for the vagus nerve? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Parasim, P A R A S Y M. Um, I'll send an email out to you guys afterwards with the link that gives you 15% off. Um, this is to be used as a bridge, it's not something that you want to use long term. I find people, you want to use it while you're going through like the thick of it, when you really need that additional support, but you're not going to rely on it long term. Great questions, guys. Jenny, okay, bye Jenny, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Anybody else have any questions? Um, we have about five more minutes.
I guess if no one else has, I kind of wondered when you talked about the negative feedback loop, um, I can find myself getting pretty stuck in that. Mm -hmm. um, and I do try breathing techniques, but um, especially around sleep, that I think that that is what keeps me up. I'm just sort of like ruminating over stuff or just, I, I really struggle to shut my brain off at night. Um, so I don't know if you had any tips or. Uh, yeah, I mean, tips for that. Um, I think definitely if you start to implement the script that we covered tomorrow, you might find that your neurotransmitter production throughout the day is much more inhibitory versus upregulating. So it'll be more production of things like GABA and L-theanine, your calming neurotransmitters. You could also take things like GABA and L-theanine. Um, L-theanine is really inexpensive. And um, that's what's in green tea that allows you to not become anxious the way coffee does. So it's an amino acid that it's, it's really effective and you can't really overdo it. You know, you might take a couple and then you're like a couple hours later, you like, I need a couple more. Um, but I find that, that that neurotransmitter balance from doing the neuroplasticity script will be a good start. And then definitely like the, that sleep hygiene stuff, right? So reading before bed, no blue light. I know it sucks, but like no TV, no iPhones, just trying to stay away from EMFs, maybe an Epsom salt bath, um, chamomile tea, lavender tea, hibiscus tea. These are all amazing at calming the nervous system. They're called nervines. Um, so, or anxiolytics, sorry. Um, so you could even look up anz natural anxiolytics and those are natural um, anti-anxiety properties. So teas and herbs are amazing at that. One of my favorite products to take is a liposomal GABA and L-theanine by Designs for Health. I don't think you can requisition that yourself. I think it's through practitioners only. It might be um, in health food stores, so I would check. But liposomal is, um, it makes it very bioavailable. It's super effective. Your cells will soak it up and it just helps to it's an inhibitory, both are inhibitory neurotransmitters, so they'll help to calm your brain waves. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, but I would say like the lifestyle stuff, self-massage, putting on beautiful body oil, taking your time to rub it into your toes and your fingers and, you know, meditation's great, breathing's great. Daydream, daydream about the ideal outcome. Daydream and be in a space of like, bewilderment with what is possible for you, you know, and that might not be available to you right now. And that's okay. You know, it, it just is a tenacious um, response to stress. It's really common. So I would say that would be the goal. Um, but reading like a, a paper, like reading a, a book that's not on a Kindle or something as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, also, one thing with the script is you want to be mindful of the music and the content that you're consuming. So um, like horror movies, thrillers, violence, um, like whodunit murder mysteries that are graphic. Um, even though we know on a conscious level that we're not under threat, the autonomic nervous system post-trauma is already dysregulated. It's the limbic system will see that and will respond in kind. So I always try to stick to comedies, like stand-up and rom-coms, um, really light movies, positive movies, really calming and uplifting music. Like I used to listen to hard techno, like really hard industrial techno when I was going through a major trauma. And now I can't do that. I just can't do it. It'll pull me out of my window of tolerance. So um, being aware of the people and the music and the content that you're consuming that might be upsetting. Like stop following people who upset you on Instagram or make you feel uncomfortable. Um, try and have healthy communication with friends who are maybe passive aggressive or codependent. Um, implement boundaries, end relationships, end friendships, protect your inner child. Anything that's toxic where you have to try to be yourself or you have to try to make it work. These are all things that drain you and will keep activating that stress response. 
So you can, you know, you can do all of the, the script covering that you want to do, but if we're, um, if we keep consuming and, and interacting with people who stress us out, uh, it's like pouring water into a bucket with holes in it. Just food yeah. for thought. Yeah, just food for thought. It takes time. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You can say hi to Jackie. <laughs> I did a retreat with her a couple ah, years ago. Amazing. <laughs> She's on the Caribbean side right now getting her permaculture degree. Oh, nice. Awesome. <laughs> I'm here by myself. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm mildly afraid of like jaguars and gorillas coming in the house. <laughs> like it's fine. I'll tell you, say hi. For never sure. thought you would say that, or did you? <laughs> What's that? I said never thought you would say that. Did you? Yeah. I'm slightly afraid of jaguars. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to see one, but I'm not allowed. I've been told I'm not allowed to go looking for them. So <laughs> lovely to meet you, Charmaine. Yeah, you as well. Thank you. I'm gonna jump off, but thank yep. you so much for this. You're welcome. I'll see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, if anybody else has questions, you have my email address. I invite you to uh, reach out. Please do. Um, it's my pleasure to answer questions. And I will see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock Eastern time. We're going to get into um, the script and the neuroplasticity work. Okay. Thank you Thank all you for your presence. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Can't Thank wait. you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.